everybody has uh, 20 minutes, 20 pure minutes. And after that, because we have three presentations, we have still half an hour more for discussion and for a short presentation of the new book, uh, Boscovich in English. So I uh, kindly invite uh, Dr. Magda Stravinsky from Romania, from Bucharest, to present her, uh, her paper, Boscovich in Romania. Hello to everybody. I hope you took your time. So the title you have seen is the Boscovich in Romania. It's not very correct for talking the epoch of Boscovich is going on in the modern Romania, but it is it was shorter. And my name is Marta Stavinsky. I am uh, from uh, the Economic Institute of Germany Academy. And in this, in, uh, I was director of this institute for 15 years. But now I'm uh, also the president of this uh, very short IT forties, as it means Institute of Transdisciplinary Study for Science, uh, uh, Spirituality and Society. And at the same time, because there, there were some questions, I'm the president of the Association for the Dialogue between Science and Theology, and Theology and Technology, in Romania. So a lot of uh, uh, preoccupations who, which helped me for uh, this uh, topic. I published something about Boscovich uh, uh, in uh, Memoria Società uh, Economica Italiana in 19, and it was a reason for me to cooperate for this symposium. Before uh, saying a few words about uh, the travel of Boscovich uh, in Romania, I have to uh, introduce a short history, very short history of Romanian astronomy before the 18th century. It means the first astronomy evidences that were 2,000 uh, uh, millennia ago. There were the Dacian sanctuaries, uh, which are very, very nice, very interesting to visit once. Uh, they are the central part of Romania. You have, uh, um, how to say, the image of this sanctuary, which is not far from uh, the model of uh, pattern of the stone bench. And you have here some, uh, how to say, uh, details of the large circular sanctuary, which uh, could be found uh, in Sagnisa Jutiza. And uh, OK, we have to, to talk uh, hours and hours about these topics. Um, another one was the Dionysius Sexy, so uh, Denis Le Petit, as the French people are saying. He was born in uh, Tomis, near Constanza, so Black Sea. Uh, he calculated the Easter day, and uh, it means a new calendar. Uh, he was contemporary with Benedict of Nasia, founder of Benedictine Order, but the most important, uh, he uh, wrote the book Liber de Pascate, uh, the book of the uh, Eastern. It means he calculated the board, uh, a new calendar uh, starting with the birth of the Jesus Christus. The Middle Ages, you have a, I have a large uh, gap. The, we had the first astronomical observer observation made in this part of Europe. They were done by a bishop, it means by a theologian, Jan Vites, Janos Vites. And the observatory was set up in Oradia, which is a city in the western part of uh, Romania, in 1445, one century before Urani bought uh, the observatory of the Tycho Brahe. He also uh, invited to go to Cuerpa, uh, the uh, people who used uh, the book uh, used by Radio Montana. And uh, he calculated Tabula Varangesis by Columbus, by Columbus, Igor Brahe, and other personality of the book. So a lot of personalities. One, of, uh, one other was Johannes Graf Montelus, who wrote uh, Rudimenta Cosmographica in 1568. There were 26 successive editions, so it means it was a very important book. And Tom Arhas, uh, who um, colleagues uh, colleague from CDU, he uh, introduced us for the first time the term of rockets. The 16th and 17th, uh, 17th uh, century are epochs of important uh, spreading of astronomical knowledge. In the even more numerous colleges who were set up in Transylvania, Moldavia, and Valachia. You have here Maximilian Herr, uh, who also uh, works in astronomy. And he found it in Alba Iulia, in another very difficult city, a very important library with uh, astronomical uh, instruments and so on. Okay, 
Ein Gang in Europa ist in der Brüne, hier der Markus Lübock, hier die Aare der Meyen Territori. Und der Meyen Lenz in der Fein Epoch, where Ballard Monte. Where Ballardia, which was, how to say, directed by Konstantin Brinkovian, who was a very clever prince, a great patron of culture. Under his reign, many texts were printed, and during his rule, an architectural style originated in Ballardia as a synthesis of Renaissance and Byzantine architecture. You have here, it's a very modern contemporary photo of a palace constructed uh, under his idea. He was uh, one of the first palace of Constantine Brancogan. Uh, he uh, was, uh, as I told you, very, uh, very great humanist. And so he uh, uh, believed that uh, the students, uh, he, his children and the other students had to be very well how to say, uh, prepared in the most important uh, university centers of Europe. He sent his sons of Notaras, who was uh, the teacher of his uh, children, his uh, sons. In, um, he died in 1731. We don't uh, know exactly when he was born. Um, to, uh, to go to the most important uh, university centers. And one of them was the Astronomical Observatory of Paris, Paris Observatory was directed by Giovanni Domenico, uh, Domenico Cassini. So Montara and Cassini were practical collaborators, colleagues, not, it was not pupil of this one. Uh, Notara published a tra Trattato di Astronomia, first appeared the coordinates of Germania City, a lot of them, Eucharist and so on, and he used uh, the data from uh, Connaissance de Town, and he published a very important uh, book, uh, which uh, is just translated in English, uh, Introductio a Geografia Mestera, with notions of uh, uh, mathematics, uh, trigonometry, astronomy, and finally he became patriarch of Jerusalem. So an important theologian who did scientists as well as was for him. In Moldavia, we had another very uh, clever, very illuminated prince, uh, Dmitry Kantunis. He was twice prince in Moldavia. He was prolific humanist, philosopher, historian, composer, musicologist, linguist, ethnographer, geographer. So, and it's very important his work, History of the Rise and Fall of the Ottoman Empire, who was, which was translated, I translated, I don't know how many times, even by the modern uh, uh, Turkish states. Uh, uh, so, uh, we had a lot of visitors in this episode. One of them was Botsov. He visited us in 1763. Another one was uh, Stefan uh, Rumovsky, uh, who wrote uh, the Terminatio Longitudinis and Latitudinis uh, in Moldavia and Balatia. So he did uh, more or less the same uh, uh, measurement as Boskovich uh, did in uh, my country. But come on back to Boskovich. Boskovich, uh, who uh, was born, uh, lived in this period, uh, 1711, 87. He visited us, uh, Dobroja and Moldavia, in 1762. It means he was a little uh, older than 50 years. And the period which is very well uh, uh, established between 24th of May and 15th July. So it's not a very short period to, uh, to know uh, Romanian peoples, Moldavian peoples, and uh, to have some uh, astronomical determinations in my country. Uh, you have here the Europe, uh, and it's very important this map. Why? Because uh, w one year before uh, the travel, uh, the trip of uh, Boscovich in uh, Romania was the transit of Venus. Maybe you know, or the people who don't, don't know, that the transit of Venus occurs uh, eight years, one pair, other 122 years, another pair of years, and so on. And this one was the uh, first, um, how to say, uh, international campaign after 1639, after uh, so many years, uh, more than 120 years, and uh, it was uh, done by a lot of people from, uh, and Boscovich liked to, to observe this uh, transit of Venus. Unfortunately, he was not able, his, his, uh, he hoped uh, to observe it a little in Constantinople. And finally, he uh, came a little later after the transit of Venus in uh, this uh, part of Europe, 
And uh, he wrote a book uh, which is named Giornali di un viaggio da Constantinople in, in Bologna. No, uh, it means crossing uh, Moldavia and uh, Dobroja. Della parte Ruggero di Giuseppe Boscovich con una sua relazione delle rovine di Troia. It is a cover of uh, one of the editions because he wrote, you, you have another one, Journal to Boer de Constantinople and Bologna. He wrote a lot of, he had a lot of, uh, how to say, edition of this book. In French, it was in 1782, 84, in German, in 80, and in uh, uh, Swiss, uh, the publication in Swiss had 323 pages. I consider a lot of pages for the books of the epoch, for the epoch. You have down uh, the signature of Giuseppe Bergorco. But uh, why he started uh, uh, Moldavia? Why? Because he belonged to the, how to say, the company of the English ambassador Porter, who left Constantinople after a stay of uh, well over 14 years. So Boscovich, Boscovich was one of the members of this uh, uh, team, say. And this epoch uh, uh, we have here on 23rd June, uh, 1762, there, it means the ambassador Boscovich, other one, and the last, Moldavia, you have here uh, the displacement of Galas uh, after crossing Bulgaria and Dobroja. So they came from Constantinople, crossing Bulgaria, Dobroja, and they stopped at Galas. Why they stopped at Galas? Why? Because the level of Danube was high after an unending rain. The travelers spent a few days in Galas to uh, uh, waiting for the, waiting the stop of the rain. And Boscovich, of course, used this uh, period for uh, some astronomical measurements. They were um, lost in the monastery of Santa Maria. Uh, and now I have to quote uh, the uh, impression of uh, Boscovich. It appeared magnificent to us after the houses, or rather covers, in which we had lived in Bulgaria. These uh, were must be more impressive. The monastery had many rooms with small windows, some with glass, others with uh, thin leather or membranes made from bloggers or intestines as a substitute for dust. It means that they, he, uh, how to say, pointed out uh, the astronomical measure with some uh, impression. When we are wearing galas, the galas, the city I mentioned, I try to determine the latitude and longitude of this port, which is one of the most important commercial towns of the city country. I had both uh, better quarter circle with reflection, with an instrument uh, of the book you have down here, the instrument of a foot and a half, with which the height, height of the sun can easily be found over the sea, where the horizon is well determined. However, it is useless in places where the irregularities of the land prevent from determining the horizon, unless one uses reflection of the water bringing together the two images of the sun, one in the water and the other in the instrument mirror. I didn't copy this only for the details, but to understand how he, uh, he explained what, what he did uh, in uh, Moldavia. This technique is quite difficult due to the correction of the quarter circle the instrument when the height of the sun is about 45 degrees, as is now the case. I use, it, I use the surface of the Danube, which was not uh, wide enough for the determination of the horizon at noon, even though I bent so much over the water as to skim its surface with the lower part of the instrument. And then, on the 27th June uh, uh, this year, he determined the latitude 45 degrees and slightly more than 20. On the following day, he found for, uh, for 45 degrees and slightly less than 20. Uh, five, four minutes, which allowed him to establish for that place a latitude of 45 degrees 23. Now it's 27. It means the measurements of Boscovich were very well done for the epoch and for instrument he had. For longitude determination, he, had, he measured the various distances between sun and moon after having set a clock that counted the seconds by means of the sun's uh, height det determined by means of this reflection in the water. However, he wasn't able to reach the desired result with sufficient accuracy. Why? Because he decided it was safer not to rely solely, uh, solely on the theory of the moon, which, although greatly improved by contemporary astronomers, at the time still left the necessary precision. So it was, uh, it has not the theory necessary to very good uh, determination. 
Then a few days later, Ambassador Porter, um, it was a mistake, it was 17 months ago, uh, and his entourage left Galas, and through good luck, the ambassador, you have, I suppose, they have uh, this uh, uh, Galas, and good luck, Vaslui, he, uh, the coming Yash, Yash is the airport for the capital of Moldavia. During the journey, they were met by Monsieur de la Roche, secretary to Prince, Prince of Moldavia, with Gore Kazimaki. And near the palace, there was a, uh, the beautiful lake he used to determine the coordinate of the place. So he used every place where stopped for some astronomical determination. But the lake, the same problem, was not large enough to give, to give him uh, by means of his curvature, the surface of the horizon, and it was necessary to make some calculation. He made some on 6 July, uh, the, uh, you have here the details. Um, he made some uh, two observations of the moon, and it passages as a meridian, gave him a different result, as you have seen, which he considered more accurate since this time he observed the moon both directly and through his reflection on the lake. The prince showed great interest in the instruments Bolshkovich had brought him. Uh, there was a CIS telescope presently designed by the famous English optician John Dolan. It means he has a very modern instruments for the epoch, and uh, uh, the extremity of which could be mounted an instrument containing a small mobile metal mirror, which Bolshkovich constructed himself in London. By, uh, by means of which the image of the sun could be projected on the world in a camera obscura for the observation of sunspots and the It means that the epoch he observed sunspots. He set up the instrument in Venice the year before, as I told you, to observe Venus, the passage of Venus uh, in front of the, the sun, but with a, no success because of the clouds. Cloudiness. The intelligence and the curiosity of the prince were partly due to the lesson they received from Monsieur de la Roche, it was the prince of Moldavia. During the meeting, they spoke at length of the passage of Venus, very interested uh, uh, was Boschkovich, and how to make the most of the observations that had been carried out. Many other problems of astronomy, physics, and other subjects were discussed. Then, Boschkovich de Moldavia, Moldova, Moldavia, the English saying, traveling to Poland, St. Petersburg, Rome, and so on. So he didn't uh, come back, never in Romania. Even the prince, uh, Kalimaki, invited him for a long sojourn, maybe five, six months, to have other determination, or not determination, but a discussion with him about the different problems of uh, culture, of science, uh, the prince as well. So it is uh, the presentation I have for you today. Maybe it's not uh, uh, complete, but uh, for the question, I'm trying to be good my presentation. Thank you. Although there are uh, some two or three minutes uh, left, uh, we will have, as we said, the general discussion in the end of the presentations, if you agree. Uh, so I invite uh, George Lachantis from Greece. Uh, George or Georgios? Hmm? Georgios. Georgios Lachantis from Greece that, uh, to present his, uh, his talk uh, with the title. Uh, he was not there, but his ideas, question mark, the virtual presence of Boschkovich in modern day science in Greece. matter remained light and influential. 
It is also of interest that recent historians of science have started to re-evaluate his role in the development of the basic doctrines of modern physics, and though not explicitly, yet they seem to think him highly of as other distinguished scientists, physicists, and chemists of the period following the so-called scientific revolution. At the time Boscovich was at the peak of his scientific activity, in Greece, a strong intellectual movement had started to exist, based principally on the philosophical, moral, social, and scientific foundations of the French Enlightenment. This movement, known, known now as modern Greek Enlightenment, was apparently the basic channel through which the ideas circulating in Europe became known to the Greek-speaking Orthodox population of the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans. The main aim of the modern Greek Enlightenment movement was to reconnect contemporary Greeks with ancient Hellens and to create a strong national identity in mind the Greek-speaking and Orthodox peoples in the Balkans. Distinguished representatives of modern Greek Enlightenment were, among others, members of the clergy like Evgenios Bulgaris, Nikiforos Theotokis, Methodios Anthrakitis, Anthemus Gazis, and others. As you may see in all these slides, all of them were high rank uh, uh, members of the clergy. Most, uh, some of them even uh, went to the rank of arch archbishops. This fact shows that contrary to what was the case in the Catholic environment, the Greek Orthodox, Orthodox Church was not negative at least to the introduction of the new generally Newtonian, in a sense, physics to the Greek-speaking lands. Naturally, there were exceptions and sometimes strong arguments on certain topics or cases, but this happened mainly between certain fanatics and the enlightened scholars and do not characterize the whole climate of the period. As an, ex and as an example of such disputes, we may refer the excommunication of Christodulos Pavlekis, the most radical and lighter of the period for his materials. This is the, uh, the main work of Pavlekis, which was based on the French Encyclopedia and uh, was uh, highly materialist. We also have to note that this movement was supported financially by many wealthy merchants through the establishment of schools, acquisition of scientific instruments for educational purposes, and usually through scholarships for young Greek students to study abroad. Actually, young Greeks during the course of the 18th century preferred to study in Italian university, universities, and especially in the University of Padua, as powerful Greek communities existed, existed in cities like Trieste, Venice, and Livorno. So that during the time Roger Boscovich found himself in Italy, a large number of Greeks studied natural philosophy in the University of Padua and published relevant books in Venice. However, Boscovich had chosen a route and seemingly never met at a crossroads with the Greek scholars. He went to Rome, became a Jesuit, and served the Pope. This should be enough for the Greeks to neglect him, if not to refer him negatively as Jesuits were considered a great threat for the Orthodox Church due to their missionary project. But this is not, of course, the only reason why Greeks failed to make themselves acquainted with Boscovich's work. Before I discuss this issue in more details, I would like to mention another occasion on which Boscovich and Greek scholars might have a chance to come closer. This is the, the journey uh, which uh, already Professor Stavis uh, has mentioned. In 1762, Boscovich started what seemed like a long journey for the time, accompanying, accompanying the English ambassador James Porter in Constantinople. They left Constantinople and through Jersey went to Poland. During this journey, Boscovich commented on the backward mentality, ignorance, and poverty of the Orthodox population and the Orthodox icons. In his memoir, there is a nice description of this journey. And uh, as we may read in this uh, memoir, he wrote about uh, in Mangalas. In these Greek houses, there are images of saints on papers, quite ugly and horrible. 
The houses themselves were extremely poor, and the icons were perpetually illuminated by the light of an ugly and dirty lamp. He did that, however, not through the eyes of a fanatic Catholic, but through the perspective of an enlightened man. It was actually the view of a cosmopolitan Catholic on the aesthetic virtues of Byzantine religious art. In Jersey, he was welcomed by Prince Gregory Kalimachis as a man of letters, and Kalimachis asked him to stay at least four or five months, but Boscovitz declined the invitation kindly, using the orders of his superiors as an excuse. In Jersey, as some Romanian, histo Romanian historians noted, Boscovitz had the chance to see for the first, very first time very modern astronomical instruments bought in London. As at that time, there was already a rather well-established educational system within the Fanagiots in the Danubian principalities, it is strange again that Boscovitz did not refer to at least one teacher or, or intellectual in the court of Kalimachis. Coming to the main question, one has to admit that after a very detailed survey of the printed Greek books on natural sciences, we have not found even one reference to Boscovitz. In my opinion, this happened not because Greek scholars, uh, due to religious matters, wished to condemn him to eternal oblivion, but because they had simply never read any books of his. Never, nevertheless, this is quite strange because, as it has been proved by the historical research, Greek scholars were, were well informed on the publications of their contemporaries and they knew Latin well. However, on the other hand, the educational character of their movement refrained them from reading original treatises of high level. There is no doubt that the Greek and Latins were more or less supporters of the Newtonian physics, and they were not in favor of Leibniz, whom they considered somewhat outdated and more inclined to metaphysics. They also accepted the atomic theory, as it came directly from their ancestors, while on the other hand, they felt not at ease with the notion of actions from distance. As one may see later, in the first two decades of the 19th century, some Greeks like Theophilos Kairis and Benjamin Lepios formulated their own theoretical schemes for the, actions, for the action between bodies, proposing the existence of some ethereal fluids, which they called Enclon and Patakiniton respectively. As we know, Boscovitz's main work, Theoria Philosophia Naturalis, Didacta, etc., appeared in Venice in 1758, and the second edition was published in 1763. The first printed books of physics in Greek was published in 1766 by Nikiforos Theotokis, and was heavily based on Peter Van Musenbrex and Abenolet works, which did not have any reference to Boscovitz's work. Nevertheless, some years later, a notable scholar in Ioannina, Athanasius Psalidas, brought Boscovitz to the fore. As to Greek historians of science, Ephemius Bokalis and Pagelis Kutalis have proved in a recent paper, Psalidas referred to Boscovitz in his manuscript on physics, which is actually a translation of Horvath's, Horvath's book, Elementa Physica, published originally in 1790. Horvath was also a Jesuit and professor of physics in the University of Trnava, now in Slovakia. Elementa Physica was a textbook composed by two more advanced works of Horvath, namely Physica Generalis and Physica Particularis. All these three books circulated, circulated widely in Central Europe and had also editions in Vienna, Italy, Germany, and Madrid. Meanwhile, Salidas had also translated the first volume of the mathematical work of another Jesuit, Georg Ignaz Metzburg. This was published later, in 1804, uh, in complete form by another Greek scholar, Emmanuel Christaris. Having in mind that Greek scholars also translated the mathematical works of another Jesuit, Andrea Takien, We may safely come to the conclusion that they had no problem to translate works of Jesuits if they, there was not any theological or ideological problem implied. 
Naturally, this was the case for mathematics, but not generally for physics. In addition, we may note that Salidas had also used an educational textbooks to bring Voskovic's general approach to Greece and not the original book. Furthermore, Salidas' influence was rather regional and he never achieved to become a real member of the circles of the scholars who are regarded as the leading fathers of the Greek scientific thought during the Enlightenment. His, his work, works circulated only in manuscript form and failed to be published. In a sense, one would argue that Chalidas had many similarities in, in his career with Voskovic. He has carried out a serious work and followed a certain programmatic course in his project or, or translation or compilation of educational scientific books, but he remained a more or less obscure figure in the framework of the modern Greek Enlightenment. Just before our concluding remarks, it would be of interest to remind which particular parts of Voskovic's theory one may find in Chalidas' work. So, one may see that Chalidas follows the general pattern of Voskovic's thoughts, concerning the notions of impenetrability, mobility, and inertia. Very similar to Voskovic's propositions, are also the way he treats the notions of attractive, repulsive, and gravity forces. He also considers, I quote, every simple part of the body, if needed, there exists something of this sort. It is, in its extension, is a point. End of quote. While he refers at least three times to Voskovic by name, which are up to now the only reference to his great to this great man of sciences in Greek scientific books of this period. Having all the above in mind, I may conclude that the research about the presence of Boscovich ideas in the scientific India of the Greek speaking lands during the 19th century cannot be considered by by any means uh, finished. I have in mind to look closer to the relevant manuscripts which have not been yet examined in so much details as is the case with the printed books, and to extend our research to the full 19th century. Then we hope that Boscovich will find the place he deserves as one of the founders of modern Greek physics, uh, modern uh, physics and chemistry. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. So we. Uh, we go to our next and to last presentation of Dan Pokanchevsky. Please, the title is Boskovich to the Philologist, the Journal of a Voyage from Constantinople to Post. We have already met some, some stuff of his in Romania in this journey, so now yes, we you. will see the code. Because I've already mentioned uh, this journal of uh, voyage from Constantinople to Poland by uh, our colleague from Romania and also by uh, Mr. From, also from Greece. Uh, I propose to speak about uh, Boscovich, Boscovich, the philologist. Uh, as you well know, philology is uh, literally translated as love of words, but it's actually more complicated than that. Um, philology consists not only in loving the words and discovering what their etymologies are, their origins, their meaning, but it is a sort of an intersection of many different disciplines, like for example, history and culture and language and uh, many others as uh, we shall uh, see. So Boschkovich, the philologist, will in this paper uh, also emerge not only as uh, some sort of a linguist or some sort of an amateur linguist, but also as a uh, historian or even a geographer or a cultural critic to a certain uh, degree. Uh, first, we should say some things about um, in this journal. It was uh, written after the journey which was conducted in 1762. Boschwitz was on uh, travel, traveling to Constantinople to uh, do some astronomical research, but in the travel to Constantinople, the whole trip was a failure because Boschwitz fell ill and he was too late. But uh, the expedition itself was not totally fruitless because we now have this uh, very valuable piece of um, historical document. Um, he, on his return uh, home, well, home, on his return 
which was eventually uh, end in London. Uh, he went to Thracia, Bulgaria, Moldavia, and Poland. And um, afterwards, he uh, wrote and tried to publish this uh, journal, which interestingly was first published in French and German translations. And the Italian uh, original was published uh, only in 1784, some three years be before Boschkovich's death. Uh, this, uh, of course, tells a lot about its popularity in those times. It was, uh, it was uh, such a bestseller that even Boschkovich had troubles uh, to find his own copy. So, uh, I shall, in this short presentation, examine two aspects of uh, this work uh, in lieu with uh, previous discussions on potentiality and actuality. We may call this first aspect, this theological potential, some sort of potentiality, which is infinite, sort of, uh, when discussing this work. This first part of the presentation will concern what we can get from the work itself uh, when we look through theological lens. And the other aspect, which will come uh, later, is how Boschkovich himself fares as a philologist in his own right. Uh, let's um, start with theological potential. Uh, I have uh, outlined several points of discussion, which are personal names, toponyms, or place names, professional titles, and references to cultural uh, aspects which can be found in this uh, work and which could uh, form some sort of uh, introduction to philological uh, research, theological analysis of this and also of other works of uh, Boschkovich. So let's start with personal names. In this uh, rather short book, my copy has some 130 pages, but it's, it's a really slim book. We have a wealth of names, and uh, there are more than 30 personal names, quite expectedly, most of them are Turkish. And others come from English, German, Italian, Greek, Moldavian, and so on and so forth, but they are in a, a minority compared to Turkish personal names. Most names refer to official persons, which is only natural because Boschkovich himself was sort of an official. Uh, he was uh, doing uh, official research in, sci uh, in uh, science, and he was also accompanied by the British ambassador. So it is only natural that he would uh, communicate with some persons of his own rank, meaning the village uh, leaders, uh, uh, the Mikmadar, who is an official of the Turkish Empire, who would follow him on the whole uh, trip to Poland and so on and so forth. But the two conclusions that we can draw uh, when analyzing this frequency of names is uh, that names of common people with whom Boschkovich very often sympathizes. He tells us uh, all the time about how they are badly treated uh, in the confines of the Turkish Empire, which is not only autocratic, but is very, very underdeveloped empire. Very, uh, in, it consists of a very large Constantinople, which is, of course, rich, and provinces which are very poor, and people are mistreated. Uh, so that those common people which are, uh, which are mistreated in the empire are actually unrepresented. So at the same time, Boschkovich uh, sympathizes with them, but at the same time with that, uh, that degree of sympathy on his side, uh, we see that they are not really heard in this book except through opinions of uh, Boschkovich. Then we have toponyms, which are place names. There are more than 100 toponyms. Uh, and of course, uh, as in the previous example, this will lead to some further research into uh, what kind of toponyms are the most frequent in what languages and so on and so forth. So this would serve only as some sort of a introduction. Uh, most of them refer to villages and towns. There are also mentions of rivers and mountains. What is interesting is that most of them are referring to villages and towns and it should be uh, concluded that, um, what I conclude actually from that is that this part of the Turkish Empire was as mentioned, quite undeveloped. There were no great commercial uh, centers. And also what is interesting is that uh, in contrast to personal names, uh, these toponyms are actually in majority not Turkish in origin. There are, of course, there is of course a considerable number of them which are Turkish, but generally not so, uh, which could also uh, so strict, elicit further inquiry to why is that so? Maybe, maybe place names are more resistant to uh, sort of cultural domination of uh, the Turks or of any other uh, invading force that uh, sort of claims a certain territory. Then we 
their professional titles. Uh, this would be linked to the, not to the previous, but the one before the previous uh, screen. Uh, there, are, there are two dominant categories of these professional titles, which are Turkish, and I nicknamed it Western. Uh, these Western titles represent sort of a world from which Boschkovic comes into the Turkish world. This is a world of ministers, ambassadors, abbots, governors, and parents. But all of a sudden, he is found in the world of Mikmadars, Kalarashis, Bariyakars, Janissaries, Sultans, Vizier, Muftias, Chayas, and Silas. So he is found in a holy uh, sort of uh, Turkish hierarchy. And as um, in the case of personal names, most of these professional titles refer to the Turks, uh, which is, of course, and again, it should be pointed out, very natural since the Turks are those who are actually uh, ruling over their own empire. Uh, rarely, though, we uh, read mentions of Vladikas, Pops, and Starokas. Vladika and Pop uh, are two functions, uh, which are actually religious functions. Uh, they are positions in the Orthodox uh, Church, and it should also uh, be some sort of pointer uh, to while uh, the secular uh, the secular regime fell down after the Turkish invasion, meaning all secular positions were annulled and replaced by Turkish ones. Uh, the Christian or the religious hierarchy still remained, and uh, it is uh, a commonplace in historical research that. Uh, for example, in Serbia, but also in other parts of the Balkans, it was the Orthodox Church and other churches, of course, uh, which actually preserved, which helped in a, a lot to preserve the national identities of the peoples of the Balkans. And of course, culture follows uh, where it is led by the words uh, themselves, since most of the uh, most of the proper names are Turkish since most of the professional titles are Turkish since most of the people that uh, Boschkovic uh, communicates with during his travel are Turkish. It follows that we actually learn most of the details uh, related to culture uh, in the context of Turkish culture. So we learn what the Kiyos, the Bezis, and the Beji, Kona, Muhara is. So the journal itself could be read as a valuable glimpse into a dominant culture imposing itself on conquered uh, peoples of the Balkans. Um, how should this open some sort of a new area of research in Boschwitz if one had not already been opened? Uh, well, as uh, many of us know, uh, today there are very dominant literary uh, schools of criticism, like postmodern criticism, like postcolonial criticism which actually view literature and culture from uh, the standpoint of uh, margin versus the dominant center. And definitely in this work, we have this margin, uh, which consists of the majority of the population, and this center, which, is, which consists of the ruling population of Turks, who are minority, but are um, uh, represented uh, sort of as a majority. So this, is, this all has been this sort of a uh, philological potential of the work, what we as philologists and cultural critics and historians can take from his work by looking philologically at it. Uh, the other aspect uh, from which this uh, presentation draws its title is mostly the philologist. And I have sorted out three main points, which are classical references, etymological attempts, and linguistic hypothesis. This is Boschwitz looking himself as an amateur philologist and giving some contribution of his uh, own. Classical references, uh, which are very uh, common throughout the entire journal, uh, reveal his um, reading list, uh, uh, reveal that he is very well read in classics. He reads ancient historians and geographers like Pomponius Mela, Pliny the Younger, Scylla, Stefan, and some of these are actually uh, counted as not very prominent uh, geographers. Some of them are minor geographers, but Boschkovic seems to be acquainted even with the minor uh, ones. Uh, he is uh, full of uh, classical references, such as uh, he mentions a place where Ovid, the famous uh, Latin uh, poet, was exiled. Uh, he knows uh, the ancient names of uh, uh, certain uh, cities, uh, certain, certain towns like Borgas, Etegis, and Borgas, which are Arcadio Polis, Asus, and Sedrinus. 
and uh, so on and uh, so forth. Uh, why is uh, this uh, classical referencing so important? Why is it uh, some sort of a uh, theological aspect? Uh, well, because if you look into a, into a definition of uh, almost, not every, but many words in a dictionary, uh, in their definition, not only have uh, the generation of the word from a previous uh, stage, but also the word uh, is also traced uh, from its literary context, from the earliest words in which it was uh, mentioned and up to the modern uh, times. So, uh, from this word, we could actually, for example, for Babada, we can actually, we wanted to give some sort of a, a definition, some overview of the a word we could, uh, in a dictionary, uh, dictionary definition, a dictionary entry, mentioned uh, that it is near Tony, which is where our was exiled, so we could, uh, we could have this sort of a historical uh, glimpse into uh, its significance, uh, which is directly linked to classical references of Rostov's to classical literature and so forth. And the other aspect are uh, Bostovich's etymological attempts, uh, which broadly taken to mean his attempts to uh, discuss uh, the meaning of a word and why the word means as it means. For example, there is a word Voivoda, he gives a very correct meaning of it from Voi, which means Vo, and Voda, which means Vodity, which means to lead. And he's not, uh, for example, he's not uh, uh, led by the word Voda, which can also mean water. And uh, he correctly translates it as a uh, war leader and translates it back into it, uh, uh, Latin, dux belly, dux, uh, meaning leader and belly from bellum in Latin meaning war, and also gives its Polish counterpart, palatin, or palatin scale, uh, plural, which is something that also could be found in dictionaries. For example, um, in a 19th century dictionary by Luke Stefanis Ferdi, the Serbian lexicographer, uh, you had the definition and then you get its translation into Latin and into German counterparts if possible. He also does the very same thing with boyery, which comes from Stalonic boy meaning battle. Uh, also for place name Moprava, Mopra means wet, but uh, Boschwitz concludes that this wet should not come from place uh, having a lot of rain, because many places have a lot of rain, but because this place is near the river which is frequently flooded. He is also acquainted with the, uh, the linguistic, okay, may, maybe not in, um, maybe not in the, the modern uh, linguistic terminology, but he is acquainted with corruption of words, uh, which over time change their forms and uh, change their, uh, their consonants and even vowels, which is in the case of Burgas, which is a corruption from uh, Pirgos. Also, there is an interesting account of how the word Moldavia came to be. He tells us a little story, which says that a Hungarian knight um, was settling this country when his dog was drowned in a river. His dog was named Molda. Hence, the river was called Moldava, and the entire land around the river, which he settled, was called Moldavia. I'm not sure how true that is, but it is uh, at least his attempt to decipher the meaning, to find basis in uh, real life, real uh, history. And then the, comes the most interesting uh, part where, where sort of Boschkovich's brilliance as the linguist shines forth. Uh, not so much in this uh, first uh, example, I will quote, language of this, he's traveling to Bulgaria. The language of this country is one dialect of Slavonic language, and with my own mother tongue of Dubrovnik also being one such dialect, they could understand me, and I could understand some things they were saying. This is fairly simple for Boschkovich, who is, uh, was born in Dubrovnik, so he was speaking the dialect of Slavonic, and also the people in Bulgaria are speaking the dialect of Slavonic in those times. So this is not uh, so much of a uh, uh, sort of genius-like uh, inference. But let's look at the following example. When he travels through Moldavia, he notices the, uh, the following. The language of this country is a mixture of different languages. There is some Slavonic in it as well as Turkish, but the most of it comes from Latin and Italian. One encounters a great amount of those Italian words which did not develop from Latin, and most Latin words are changed in this language in the same way as in nowadays Italian. This has convinced me that the origin of this kinship of their language with Italian 
there is not lines of fact. Um, in the old age, that in the old age there were Roman colonies here, and neither is it because of the influence of the church in its first centuries of existence, as many have claimed here. But the origin of this linguistic similarity lies in that the Italians have traded in past centuries with this country and have their colonies here. So to draw such kind of conclusion, one needs to uh, to look at the language at uh, at least two time uh, two uh, chronological levels. Uh, uh, one is uh, diachronic, which means through history. He needs to know Latin, and he needs to know current uh, uh, vulgar forms, of spoken forms of Latin, which are like Italian, French, uh, Spanish, uh, Moldavian, Romanian, and so on. Uh, so he needs to know uh, the, uh, the, the sort of the first language in the course of history, which is Latin, and then its derivations, like Romanian and Italian. But then again, he needs to know a lot of other languages as well, such as Slavonic, and, and Turkish, he needs to know them to a certain degree to notice that there are ingredients of them in the language as well. And he also needs to uh, to know, uh, to speak a lot with the population, to notice that there are many words which do not derive directly from Italian, but derive from Italian, which was derived uh, directly from uh, Latin. So he concludes that this language of Moldavia is actually far more complicated than a simple spoken version of uh, Latin uh, language, which was later developed into its own uh, literary language. So he is uh, here um, analyzing the language on both uh, synchronous and on uh, diaphragmatic uh, <coughs> basis. And of course, across a wide variety of uh, languages. And to draw some uh, conclusions about this uh, journal, it is of course a literary text of high value as can be witnessed from its rich layers of meaning and of interpretation. It is a relevant historical text as we have already seen in uh, previous presentations. Uh, it references us to Boschwitz in Romania, his connections with the Greeks and so on. There is a wealth of cultural references. It is a great lexicographical source. And there are linguistic inferences worthy of mention, so uh, I'm not very acquainted, not at all acquainted with Moldavian or Romanian. But the thesis that Boschwitz throws out, even though it might not be true or correct, uh, definitely deserves some mention, at, as it is not really amateurishly uh, positive, but is positive with some uh, background uh, in. Uh, Scholarship, and I hope that this rather general introduction to Boschke, which is uh, uh, work, uh, is really an introduction in which many, many, uh, many, many scholars from different areas of uh, expertise will join and analyze each of these uh, parts in their own right. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>